right over here, the gentleman with the hat on. Yeah, Will, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have two questions for you, if that's go ahead. okay. All right. Uh, the first one, and there seemed to be a bit of confusion, is the definition of atheism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the assertion that a God doesn't exist. Rather, it's just the lack of belief that a God does exist. So, okay, uh, stop right there. Okay, because that's a good point. That's what atheists tend to say, that it's a lack in belief uh, that God does not exist. Okay, is it just a lack in belief? Let's take a little closer look at it, and then we'll go to your second question. First of all, if so, it's merely a claim about the atheist state of mind, not a claim about whether God really exists or not. Yeah. Right? Okay, so if you're just, if someone, if an atheist is just saying, I just lack a belief, okay, well, that's fine, but you're not really saying anything about the real world. Okay, if, if you're saying that atheists just lack a belief in God. If so, it also means that rocks, trees, and animals are also atheists because they also lack a belief in God. Exactly. Which wouldn't really be saying anything, right? Okay, so... Uh, that's not really a, a good way of putting atheism. And also, if atheists are saying it's just a lack of belief in God, why do they insist that God isn't needed to explain reality because, you know, they use evolution, quantum theory, multiverses? Those are positive beliefs. I also noticed that many atheists, including my friend Christopher Hitchens, who I said died a couple years ago, didn't really call himself an atheist. What he called himself was an anti-theist. Yes. In other words, he's positively against God. He's fighting against God, which is why at the end of the debate I said, you can sum up Christopher Hitchens' position in one sentence. There is no God and I hate him. Okay? He was angry with God. So this idea that atheism is just a lack in belief mm -hmm. is really a, a, a vacuous claim because it's only a claim about a person's state of mind, not about the real world. So the real brave atheists are the ones who say, look, I think the evidence shows there is no God. Yes. Um, well, if I could just clarify, the idea mm -hmm. is that atheism really is a claim that shouldn't exist at all, is a term that shouldn't exist at all. It's like saying you're an A leprechaunist or an A unicornist. Uh, the only reason we have to classify ourselves as this is because we're existing outside of normality. Right, but no matter what, whether you want, whether you want to call yourself an atheist or a non-theist or an anti-theist, Everybody who makes a claim and wants to be a reasonable person has to explain reality from that vantage point. In other words, an atheist would have to explain if he's gonna be reasonable and consistent, where did the universe come from? Where did design come from? Where did morality come from? Where did the laws of logic come from? Consciousness, all of these things that we all know about that are not material things, yet atheists is trying, are trying to say that everything's material. Well, we know that everything's not material because we're, for example, using the laws of logic right now, which are not material. Mm -hmm. Well, the entire point I'm trying to make here is mm -hmm. that atheism is not a set of beliefs. Atheism doesn't back quantum theory, doesn't back the multiverse theory. It's simply oh, the okay. lack of a belief okay, that Okay, but the, here, here's the problem, though. Hear me out on this, Will. The problem is you can say that if, if you want to be an atheist, but you're not saying anything about anything outside your skull then. Exactly. Which is, who cares, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, if, if, the if, point you, is if you want to be a reasonable person, you've got to say, okay, I lack a belief in God, and then therefore I'm going to try and explain how the universe came into existence, morality, design, and all these other things in another way. Okay, what is yeah. that way then? Well, the point is, the book title itself classifies atheism almost as a belief, uh, because it, in order to have faith, faith being the firm belief in something for which there is no proof, you have to have a claim that you're backing. Atheism makes no claim. Atheists have beliefs outside of their uh, lack of religious no, state no. of mind. No, no. Every atheist, the new atheists, like Dawkins, Hitchens, ha Sam Harris, they all make these claims. Evolution... Gets rid of design atheism. for God. Quantum theory means we don't need a beginner when in fact we do. The multiverse, it tries to explain away design. Those are positive beliefs. They're not just yes. a lack in a belief. But they're not atheism. These are what all atheists say, though. That's not what I'm saying. Um, okay. Go, go on to your second point. Second, your second point question? is the argument from uh, complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you call the tele something? The teleological argument. Telos is a word meaning design or purpose, yes. That as well as the cosmological argument. They're great arguments for deism, uh, showing that there has to have been some sort of cause. But all it boils down to is an argument from ignorance, which as you probably well know is a logical fallacy. You're saying, I don't know how this came to be, therefore we're going to accept this statement. So you really can't be intellectually honest if you're saying 
from a philosophical standpoint or even a scientific standpoint that this is proof that a God exists because you're simply saying, I don't know, and then jumping to, well, okay, it must be this. You're saying that this is a God of the gaps argument. That's what you're trying to say. Uh, okay, exactly. that's, that's not what we're saying. Let me, let me give you just two minutes on this. You see this? I this do. is an amoeba, something the Darwinists say we all evolved from. And uh, notice An it does, ancestor of the amoeba. Yeah. Now, now, notice it doesn't say made by Yahweh or made by natural forces on it, right? Yes. So, always the scientist is going to have to make an interpretation. In other words, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Yes. And we have, there's an article on our website by that name, Science Doesn't Say Anything Scientists Do. You can read it to see what it's about. But... This was considered no big deal back in Darwin's day. This was considered to be a blob of protoplasm and maybe natural forces could come together and put this together and through natural selection we could all be here. There's no need for a designer in other words. Today we know that that's not the case. In fact, inside of this little amoeba is something that clearly has the marks of design. In order to show you this, I gotta take you to your breakfast table. How many people in here like alphabet cereal? Let's suppose you want to have a bowl of alphabet cereal, you're a teenager, you come downstairs to have a bowl of alphabet cereal, and you see that the cereal's knocked over on the table, and right in the middle of the table, the letters spell, take out the garbage, mom. <laughs> what are you going to assume? The cat knocked the box over? Earthquake shook the house? No, you're going to say that that's intelligent design from an intelligent being, mom. Now, here's the question. Do we just lack a natural explanation when we see take out the garbage mom? Or is that positive evidence for an intelligent being? Well, in and of itself, it's not evidence for an intelligent being. We can make the inference because it's a natural process. Um, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. What was that? <laughs> we, we can make an inference. We, that, it, you always make inferences. Yes. Are you inferring that... An earthquake did this or that mom did this? You're inferring that your mom did this because you have evidence of things like this not happening outside of intelligence. That's exactly the else. point. However, you got it. with the universe, we only have one universe. Hold on, hold on. I'm not done. Okay, this, okay. I'm just saying okay. that this is evidence of intelligent design and you agree with that. Sure. Okay. Well, if this is intelligence or evidence of an intelligent design, then DNA must be as well. Because you see, DNA is a message like take out the garbage mom, but in a human being, it's three billion letters long. So if something that's what, 15 letters long requires an intelligence, then something 15 billion letters or, or, 13, or three billion letters long requires an intelligence. You say, well, maybe it started simpler. Like uh, maybe it started in an amoeba. The problem in an amoeba has a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia worth of information in it. The simplest code is thousands of volumes long. So if take out the garbage mom shows there must be an intelligent being, then it seems to me that a message much longer also requires an intelligent being. And by the way, it's not me who came up with a thousand volumes in a microscopic amoeba. It's Richard Dawkins himself. Yes. The most famous atheist in the world. So when we infer to design, we are not creating a God of the gaps argument here. We are saying that we have positive evidence for intelligence. My only problem here is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Take out the garbage mom isn't all too extraordinary, but an entire universe you're attributing to a creator for which there's no evidence, for which you've said is outside of time, outside of space, doesn't, uh, isn't made of matter. Right. So you're trying to prove what is in its nature, unprovable. Why is it unprovable? We're, we're, we are using spaceless, timeless, immaterial things right now. Like what? The laws of logic. True, but they're conceptual. They are conceptual, but they're not just conceptual. In other words, they would exist even if no humans existed. They in and of themselves are conceptual, but for them to be applied, there has to be uh, a physical being, a physical mind to, you know, make the computations and apply the laws of logic. Well, of course, you have to have a mind to apply the laws of logic, but the laws of logic exist even if no minds existed yes. on the earth, right? So they're not just human conceptions. They are grounded in a mind, you're correct. What mind? The immaterial, spaceless, timeless mind. Here's my only problem with that. The laws of logic in and of themselves don't do anything. This God you're claiming 
has created the entire universe. Right. So you're making a jump here from something that's purely conceptual that you know, we can't prove exists that's immaterial, but that we only apply, that doesn't act in and of itself. And you're saying, well, that's the same as this immaterial God. Okay, that's well, let me ask universe. you this. Well, what, if it's not, if space, matter, and time had a beginning, what caused it? I don't know. Well, you can say I don't know, or you can follow the evidence where it leads. Space, time, matter had a beginning, and the being must also be personal to create, to make a choice to create must also be intelligent to put this universe together with such precision, must also be moral because we have the moral law, must also be a creator in order to create from nothing and powerful. Those are the attributes of God. Why wouldn't you just accept that? When you jump to must be personal because we exist. No, 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 not personal because we exist. Personal because, because anything exists. Okay, because he made us the way we are. No, 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 um, no, 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 no. Personal to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation. The bean had to make a choice. Gravity doesn't make choices, right? Okay. So a, I'm, I'm a, still a not personal bean actually lines up logically. It seems like kind of a jump just based on wishful thinking. It all boils down to an argument from ignorance. I don't know. No, 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 no. So it's, this has to be. No, it. no, no. Will, Will, it's not an argument from ignorance. There's positive evidence that a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator exists. That's what we've been given here. Just as much evidence that there's a spaceless, immaterial, flying spaghetti monster that exists. No, 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 because a f the flying spaghetti monster is a being inside the universe, if he exists at all, made of spaghetti. But, <laughs> spaghetti but had a beginning. It's by material. By his nature, he's outside of the universe. He simply chooses to appear to us in the form of spaghetti. Well, if, if you, if you want to call the God of the Bible the flying spaghetti monster, be my guest, but you're not going to find it in the scriptures. The point is simply that you can't prove something that's immaterial. You can claim to make these blanket statements and just jump from one claim to another, Will, but it's not proof. Will, Will, what do you mean by proof? Physical proof. What, what does that mean, physical proof? Is the universe not physical? The universe is physical. Okay, well, that's physical proof right there. The whole universe had a beginning, so it can't come from more physical because all physical had a beginning. It had a beginning, but the, uh, the jump is when you say that beginning was a creator. Well, I'll, if there was a creation, there has to be a creator. Am I right? If you're presupposing that it's a creation... I'm not presupposing it. The atheists are telling me that. There's an existence. If you presuppose that it's a creation, then there has to be a creation. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay. Honest answer. Honest. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Well, I, I have to preface this by saying I would believe it was true if there was evidence for it, but I would not be a Christian. Why not? I don't believe, with, uh, I don't believe a lot of the things that the Bible says to be moral. So you have your own moral standard by which you judge the my, Bible. My moral standard is based on empathy, emotion. What would I want them to do to me? Well, Jesus said something like that. That's pretty good. So did Confucius. Yeah, that's, that's called the, that's called the, the golden, golden rule, rule yeah. which is known even without the Bible. We know yes. that. But so, um, I, I prefer Confucius's version because he says it uh, like this, do to others as they would wish you do to them requires a bit more thinking, a bit more empathy, mm -hmm. but uh, it's much more accurate because it's not that there's some third party setting the moral standards. It's that you're interacting with your fellow beings and you're seeing what would be best for all of you to exist as a cohesive unit. Well, you know, hit, 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 Hitler said what would be best is to kill all the undesirables and that would be best for, for the human race. Did he have the authority to say that? He had the authority to say that, but it doesn't necessarily make him correct. Well, there has to be a standard outside of Hitler and me and you that establishes what is correct then. That's what we mean by God. I, I get what you mean by it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily make it true. Because we can get our moral uh, principles simply by empathy. Simply by saying, well, if I were to smack someone, that would be bad because I wouldn't want them to smack me. Well, we'll... I could spend, I've Confucius. got several slides where we could talk about this, but I know other people right. want to ask questions. Yeah, I, I kind of figured. Thank you for being honest by answering that even if it were true, you would not be a Christian. You have yes. the free will to reject. That's why God gave you free will, so you could reject or accept.
but okay. thank you. We can talk more if you want. Let's right. go to somebody else. Thank you. There's a gentleman right over here, or either way. Yes, sir. Okay, so am I correct in assuming that when you said the apostles saw Jesus, they wouldn't want to lie about it because they were under the impression of death or torture or something like that? Basically, why would the apostles die for something that they knew wasn't true, correct? Sure, yeah, why would they do that? Why would an average soldier in the SS want to die if he knew that the Ubermensch wasn't true? Well, of course, the soldier, in many cases, uh, believes in the whole Uber theory. I mean, they were brainwashed, they were propagandized. Why can't so, we say this is also true about the apostles then? Well, you would need evidence for that. What evidence do you have that they were? The, the problem is that we don't have any evidence that we were because we can't go back to the time when Jesus was walking around with his apostles and telling them what he told them. Well, that's true about all history. You can't go back in time. You're absolutely right. So what you have to do is rely on the physical evidence and the written evidence from the time mm -hmm. in order to discover what happened. That's what all history does. Okay. You said something about how God's design is perfect, correct? No, it depends no. on what you mean by perfect. In a, in a world constrained by physical uh, laws or, or physicality, there's always constraints. In mm -hmm. other words, there's optimization based on what the creator is making his creation for. For example, this laptop uh, was designed to travel with mm -hmm. and do presentations like this. Yeah. But it's inadequate to say run NASA, okay? If it, would, it had to run NASA, it'd be the size of this room. So there's always trade-offs when you design. You have to design things based on the purpose for which you're designing them. What so there's no such thing as perfect design. There's optimal design, we might say. Well, when you look at the design of the human himself, mm -hmm. we have a coccyx and we have an appendix. Mm -hmm. If design were perfect, of humans, then why would we have these things which are essentially superfluous? I just said there's no such thing as perfect design. Okay. It depends on the intent of the designer. Okay. And the premise behind the question is, and I've heard atheists say this, well, why didn't God make us with, say, Teflon veins or something so we wouldn't, you know, get, uh, get our arteries clogged? Mm -hmm. Well, God doesn't intend for us in this state to live forever. The, the, the point is we're in a fallen world and we do run down and we do die. Mm -hmm. So that's the intent. If that's the intent, then the design is fine. But just because a design isn't what you think it should be doesn't mean there's no design. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I, I like this computer, but a lot of times I hate it. All right? And I might say, this thing isn't designed very well. I, that might be true, but that doesn't mean it's not designed at all. Mm -hmm. It's quite obviously designed. Whether I like it or not, that's another question. Mm -hmm. Okay, my last question is, earlier on in your presentation, you showed a picture of exterminated Jews at a concentration camp, correct? Yes. And you said that these bodies essentially were proof of the existence of a god, correct? No, no, no. Well, what not I proof, but what I'm trying to say is people would see these bodies and think that there's probably a God. No, 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 no. The argument was that a Holocaust is objectively wrong. Well, and if something's objectively wrong, there must be something that's objectively right. How is it objectively wrong, though? Because the people who were committing it thought that what they were doing was right. Oh, people think all sorts of different things about right and wrong. That's not the point. The point is, if there's one thing morally wrong, then God exists. Just one. Well, if it's wrong to torture babies for fun or murder Jews in a Holocaust. Well, that, co that completely is dependent upon a person's view on torturing Jews or murdering babies. But the thing is that we as humans, we have empathy in us probably because it's designed to preserve our species. We don't have empathy necessarily because some God gave it to us. We have empathy so that we can preserve our own race. Okay, but here's the problem. It's, it's a good question. It's kind of related to what, um, to what Will had said. So let me... Let me answer it in a little bit more detail, and then we'll get to some other, other questions. Because the question is, can evolution explain morality? That's really the question that you're, you're saying. Well, we got this empathy here, and that ought to explain it. First of all, moral laws are not chemical or biological. They're immaterial, and they come from personal agents. If there's no God, there's no such thing as a law. 
There just is chemicals. There just are biological entities. Secondly, chemistry and biology are descriptive, not prescriptive. Evolution describes what does survive, not what ought to survive. Why should humans survive? That would be speciesism. We just say, well, we humans, we ought to survive. Why? Opposable if there's no thumbs. God. What's that? Opposable thumbs. We're what? able to grasp yeah, But things. why? What, what's, what? Because that's what we need to survive and cope. No, no, I know, but why should we survive as opposed to any other species? Survival of the fittest. Right, that's exactly what Hitler believed in. And that's why he was trying to get rid of the unfit because the unfit were taking resources from the fit. And so he wanted to create the super race. The question is, should he have done that? He's just following. In fact, if you read Mein Kampf, which was Hitler's book, his 1933 book, what he does is he quotes from Darwin. And he says, if the weaker race does not want to survive, and they, or if, if the weaker race does not want to fight, they have no right to survive. Also, should we rape to survive? I mean, if survival is our goal, maybe we ought to rape then because we can propagate our DNA by raping, can't we? Yes, essentially, but we don't need to rape people when we have the ability to consent. That's true, but what the, the point here is, is consent, there's no reason to consent if there's no moral law, you can just rape and survive that way. You don't need consent. Also, should we murder the weak to help others to survive? That's Hitler's point. And by the way, since evolution is a process of change, then morals must change. Rape may one day be considered good. I mean, if, if we're always in flux here, then yeah. one day we're going to say rape is good. Finally, why cooperate when not cooperating often helps you survive? Will made this point earlier when he's saying, look, you know, if I show empathy to you, you'll show empathy to me. Well, that's not even true. Stalin didn't show empathy to anybody except his inner circle, and he died on his deathbed after killing 20 million of his own countrymen, shaking his fist at God one last time. So you don't have to cooperate to get along. In fact, quite often, you can get ahead by not cooperating. What's that? No, it's much easier to be selfish than it is to be selfless. Much easier. If you don't think so, go to... I hate to say this. I'm going to say it anyway. Go into any corporate boardroom. Go into any, on, on, not any, but many elder boards. If you don't think there's politics where people are jockeying to try and get their own way, you haven't lived very long. Good questions, though. Mm -hmm. that the speed of light wasn't always the speed of light and the, the faster now it slows down. I call that the second paradigm. You would have said the speed of light is constant now. Why wasn't it always? Yeah, Alan Guth at MIT came up with inflation theory and it's a bit controversial. Um, but the problem, one of the problems with inflation theory as I understand it is you have to have a period of inflation and then a, a quick period of deflation and it, it's obviously we're not observing this now. It's speculative, but it doesn't really get needed. Uh, you, you don't, it doesn't get rid of the need for a creator. You know whether there is inflation or how it was created. That's a whole other story. But you still need a creator. There was somebody over here who had a question. I thought, yes, that gentleman right there. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, someone over there was saying something about how um, we have, a, have morals to survive or something, mm -hmm. but when we're actually the species that kills each other the most, how does that help us survive? That yeah, you're right. Yeah. We, we kill yeah. each other the most. We kill our, our children in the womb. We, yeah. we do all sorts of awful things to one another. And, but the, the point isn't what we do. The point is what we should do. Yes. That's the point. Yes. Okay, we all, there's a, there's a difference between sociology and morality. Sociology is what people do. Morality is what they ought to do. And we all, everybody in this room knows that there are objective realities when it comes to morality. Certain things are really right, other things are really wrong. If that's the case, then God exists. 
Now, you may, yeah. not, you may not like that. You may suppress it. You may want to go your own way. In fact, I want to do that half the time. You want to do it. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You want to suppress the truth half the time. You do. This is inconvenient. You want to go your own way. I do. Our big, you, know, you know who our biggest problem is? We are. Um. We're the biggest problem. We've got so much pride, we just want to do things our way. We're our biggest enemy. Thank you. Next uh, question. I had another thing, though. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, it, this is a comment, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, just I as long as it's not too long. We've got a lot of yeah, people waiting, so go ahead. pretty quick. I seem to remember that Darwin said that if we, if this one point of his theory got proven wrong, that the entire thing should be thrown away. Yeah, his point was, and is, it was is and that it was proven wrong. Well, well, yeah, he, his point was is that if 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 any uh, biological entity could not be formed by gradual successive modifications, my theory would ultimately break down. Well, that was the point of Michael Behe's book, 1996, called Darwin's Black Box, where he opened the black box of the cell and realized that the cell is irreducibly complex. You can't build it in stages. It has to be built all at once. And if that's the case, then Darwinism can't do the job. And I, st I, th I still think he's right about that. All right, who else? There's a gentleman in the back over there. Well, he's already there, so there you go, sir. Thank you, Dr. Turek. Uh, what, uh, what would you say to people who uh, are saying that the Gospels are written in the second century after uh, a great deal of oral tradition has been mutated? First of all, we know that's not the case. Even atheists admit that 1 Corinthians is written in 55 AD because we can date when Paul was in Corinth. We can date it by an inscription in Delphi, Greece, of Gallio, when Gallio was the proconsul in Corinth. And we can trace all of Paul's writings to that particular archaeological discovery. And we know that 1 Corinthians is written by 55 AD. We also know that the creed in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8 is pre-40 AD. Even atheists admit this. So there's not much sense in saying it was written in the second century. We also know if you look at the book of Acts and you look at the Gospel of John, there are eyewitness details in there which are all in the book which could only have been known by an eyewitness or somebody who knew an eyewitness. So to say they were written in the second century doesn't make any sense. Also, the early church fathers are quoting from the books in the first century. So if the books are being quoted in the first century, they obviously can't be written in the second century. There's even a commentary written at the end of the first century. So it just makes absolutely no sense to say they're written in the second century. This gentleman back there. Our, uh, well, my name is James. Are hey, you James. of the opinion of uh, the old Earth or young Earth? Are you uh, as far as the age? I of am the universe? absolutely convinced that the universe is at least fifty-one years old. <laughs> it is an excellent question, and let's just spend a few minutes on it because uh, it's a question that a lot of people. Uh, bring up how old is the universe and my point is is that no matter what view you take of the universe you're going to make an assumption that you can't necessarily prove so for example is it old well the light from the stars if the light from the stars has not changed if the speed of light hasn't changed the universe is 13.8 billion years old okay if it has changed we don't know now is it a good assumption to say it hasn't changed probably so many other things are dependent on the speed of light, but I haven't been here that long, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe it has changed. Also, salt in the ocean is you often used to try and date the Earth young. Well, you have, to make, you have to make assumptions there. The same thing is true with radioactive dating, which is not used to date the universe, but is date, to, uh, date objects in or on the Earth. And then you have to make assumptions you can't prove either. You have to assume some things have stayed the same or 
the, the, uh, the amount of uh, uranium uh, or the amount of lead was assumed to be zero in the beginning. These are all assumptions that you can't prove. Now, a lot of people say, well, the Bible shows that the universe is young. Let me ask you a question. What does the first verse of the Bible say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning. When was the beginning? In the beginning. Does it say? Doesn't say. Well, you say the days. Well, hold on. In the very first verse, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say when that was. Since the initial creation happened before day one, the Bible doesn't say how old the universe is. When does day one begin? It begins in verse three. All the days begin with the phrase, and God said. Now, could it be six or so thousand years old? Of course, I'm, I'm open to that. I'm just saying, we often think that the universe, or we often think that the Bible says something it doesn't say. It doesn't say it's 6,000 years old. Now, even if you think the days are pertinent to the age question, the word for day in Genesis could have four different possible meanings. In fact, words don't really have meanings, they have usages. Like if I say the word bark, what does that mean? You don't know. Do I mean the bark of a tree or the bark of a dog? It depends on the context, how I use it. There are four possible usages. 12 hours? Why? Because verse 5 says he called the day, or he called the light day and the darkness night. That's 12 hours. Could be, of course, the common 24 hours. Could also be uh, an era, like if we were to say Peyton Manning was a great quarterback in his day. We wouldn't think Peyton Manning was just good for 24 hours, would we? No, we get the idea. Or the fourth usage I'll get to in a minute. Also, the third day seems to require longer than 24 hours because you got the growth of vegetation, including fruit-bearing plants. You say, well, God could have sped it up. Yeah, he could have, but now you're making an assumption you can't prove, right? I, you put miracle Grow on stuff, it doesn't grow in 24 hours, <laughs> all right? And the sixth day also seems to require longer than 24 hours. Naming of the animals. You know how many animals are out there? In fact, Brad Stein, who's a Christian comedian, kind of has a bit on this. He goes, in the beginning of the day, Adam was really, really creative. He'd see an animal come by, he'd go, hippopotamus. He'd see another one come by, rhinoceros, by the end of the day. <sighs> Cow. <laughs> Ox. You know, he's just out of gas. Can't do all that in 24 hours. Now here's the fourth possible usage of the word day. The seventh day hasn't ended yet. That's an indefinite period of time. We're still in the seventh day right now, according to Hebrews 4. If we're in seventh day right now, maybe the other days are one. We simply don't know. The bottom line is there is no conflict between science and the Bible. There's a conflict between some interpretations of the science and the Bible. It may be old, it may be young. It's not definitive. What is definitive is that there was a creation. That God created, not when. So I urge you, if you think this is an important issue, fine. But don't make it a test for orthodoxy. Particularly the young earthers say, well, if you're not a young earther, you're, you're not a believer. That's just stupid. Because I guarantee you this, when you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, did you think I was old or young? <laughs> oh, you thought it was old? You're out of here. And by the way, this has never been a controversy in the church until recently. What was the bigger controversy 400 years ago? What? No, 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 no. Although that was. I'm, I'm talking about science. Yes, yes, do we go around the sun or does the sun go around us? I submit to you that you can make a better case if you just take a literal interpretation of the text that the earth doesn't move, that the sun goes around the earth than you can that the universe is 6,000 years old or whatever. It says the earth doesn't move. It's set on its foundations. It says the sun rises and the sun sets. But nobody says if you believe that the earth moves and the sun doesn't, nobody says you're giving up the Bible. Are you a moving earther or, or a, a stationary earther? Nobody says that. Why? Because we use our knowledge of science of the general revelation to say, ah, this is phenomenological language. It's not meant to be an astronomy lesson. It's meant to observe, just like we do today. When you go home tonight and you watch the uh, weatherman, the weatherman's going to say, sunrise tomorrow, 7-11. He's not going to say, 
sunrise will become, or he's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent at 7-Eleven. <laughs> he's using phenomenological language. We do that all the time. In fact, I just used it all the time. We speak in phrases that aren't literal, don't we? And the Bible does the same thing. People say, do you take the Bible literally? I said, where it's meant to be taken literally. Just like when you're talking to me, I'll take what you say literally that's meant to be taken literally. But if you say, look, my car cost me an arm and a leg, I don't think you're a double amputee. <laughs> and what we tend to do with the Bible for some reason is we tend to literalize everything when not everything's meant to be taken literally. If it was, then God would have to have wings and God would have to have eyes and God would have to have a body and Jesus would have to have hinges because after all, he's a door. I mean, use your common sense. All right, who else? There's a gentleman down here. And while we're getting the mic down here, did you hear that one Adam said to another Adam, I just lost an electron. And the second Adam said, are you sure? And the first Adam said, I'm positive. <laughs> anyway. This side does not get it. All right. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hey, Frank. So I've been going through your book, and I have a grasp on what the Roadrunner tactic is, yes, but sir. I want to see if it's applicable here. Uh -huh. um, I get into discussions with my coworkers about apologetics-related stuff frequently, mm -hmm. and one of the responses that I get, you know, actually a couple times is something along the lines of, you know, you're wrong. And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, every law has an exception except this one. Now, I feel like there's, you know... Uh, wait, wait, wait. Every law has an exception again, again yeah, except they, what they, one? They say, they say every rule has an exception except this one, you know? Do, they, wait, wait. Does the rule that every rule have an exception have an exception? Yeah, and that's, that's what I thought. And then they would tag on except this one. And I'm like, well, you know, what basis do they have yeah, for that? Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, like, because they say that, I, I, my, my thought was to say, well, doesn't that have an exception? But then they say, well, every, every rule does accept, has an exception except the one I just said. So... And I'm just like, I don't, I'm just so stunned by that. I don't have a response. Well, if you're stunned, what you can say is, now look, we're all adults here. <laughs> Mr. Poopy Pants. Because that's just stupid. I mean, some things are just stupid. They're not even worth responding to, right? I mean, that person just isn't interested in the truth. That person is just trying to throw up all sorts of smoke. That's what's, what's why you may ask the question, if it were true, would you become a Christian? If they say no, fine, move on, right? The person's not open to truth. The person already has made up his mind. So if they're going to come up with silly stuff like that and not acknowledge the truth, you see, there's a difference between proof and persuasion. You can prove something, but that doesn't mean someone's going to be persuaded by it. Go back to Pascal. People almost invariably base their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. So you would call that closed-mindedness if they yes. give a response like that? yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Whatever that meant. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, sir. Oh, no, wait, let's go to somebody else. I want to make sure other people, who, because you already had a question. If someone else has a question, uh, if not, we'll go back to you. But if anyone else had a question, down here, this gentleman right here. That's uh. It's always a good question. Don't worry. Go ahead. <laughs> so in your, uh, one of your last slides, you talked about how things changed with the disciples after Jesus' death. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about Trinity versus single God, et cetera, right. et cetera. Right. At one point, you said seventh day to Sunday worship. Right. I was wondering where exactly you got that text from the Bible. That's Colossians chapter 2. Well, that's when Paul says... Let's not, don't let anyone tell you that you need to worship on any Sabbath day or you need to acknowledge any Sabbath day. They started meeting, it's somewhere in the book of Acts, if anyone can find the reference, I think it's in the book of Acts. They began meeting on the first day of the week, which happened to be a work day, and it wasn't the Sabbath. So you, you, you talk about Levitical law, and that is mm -hmm. something, but then you have something such as the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. which is written by the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, the commandments of God himself have changed no, because of Jesus' death? No, th all the commandments were fulfilled by Jesus. But were they changed? 
they were fulfilled. They weren't changed. So they're not applicable, not all of them on us anymore. In fact, out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament. There's only one that isn't. Keep holy the Sabbath. The other nine are all repeated. Because we're not, we're not in a, a um, theocracy anymore. That's done. So the Sabbath day is no longer in effect. I might add to that just one comment, but yes. yet the Sabbath day is the only commandment that says remember it. Well, we can remember it, just like I remember things in history, but that doesn't mean we necessarily practice it today. What? Well, I mean, this is an internal dispute among Christians, but then why would Paul say, don't let anyone tell you you have to worship on a particular Sabbath day? That's Colossians chapter 2. See, we're free from the law. See, a lot of Christians don't understand. We're free from the law because Christ has fulfilled it. But James says, in James chapter 2, there's a law of liberty. What does that mean? It means that if you obey God's commands, you will be free from the consequences of not obeying those, com of not obeying those commands. And that, in other words, laws help you live a better life. You don't work your way to God by obeying the laws but you can live a better life and be a better witness to others if you live a moral life. But those, those, you're, you're not winning favor with God by living a moral life, or you're not putting God in your debt. You are just making your life better, and you're being a better witness to others. But the whole book of Galatians, as you know, is all about let's not get involved in legalism. Don't, 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 don't think you're going to work your way to God. What you started by the Spirit, you're not going to finish by the law. Anybody else? This gentleman right down here. I, I think uh, at one time or another, Christians and especially you know, non-Christians have struggled with, uh, when you think about morality and uh, when God uh, had uh, both uh, not only the men but the women and the children uh, slaughtered like after Moses came down from the mount. Mm -hmm. And he opened up the earth and mm -hmm. everyone. It, wh what's your um, response to that? Well, even a, a more dramatic one is the whole generation of Noah. I mean, that's, everybody's dead except for eight people. Here's the question. When God judges people, whether it's Noah, whether it's the Israelites, whether it's the Canaanites, whatever it is, does God, is God arbitrary? Does he just wake up one day like a mafia boss and go, Canaanites want him dead! No. He always gives reasons. What are the reasons? Well, in the terms of the Canaanites, they're practicing not only bestiality and, and uh, all sorts of sexual sin, they're also sacrificing their children to the molten god Molech. They would literally put their kids on a molten hot bullheaded god and the kids would shrivel up on the arms of this heated god and the musicians would play their, beat their drums louder so the parents couldn't hear their own kids screaming. And you know, I always hear atheists saying, if there is a good God, why doesn't he stop all the evil in the world? And here's an instance where God steps in and stops this evil and the atheists are complaining about it. You notice that? Look, you want him to step in or not? He steps in and he stops it. Now, the key question here is, can God murder anyone? We can murder because we're not the giver of life, so we're, we're not supposed to take life, but God has the authority to take life anytime he wants. He has the authority to take you out at two years old or 82 years old. It's up to him. In fact, if God exists and if there's an afterlife, people don't really die, they just change location. God can move you from this location to another location anytime he wants. So if you look in the Old Testament, these instances of God intervening to kill people, that's totally within his prerogative. And by the way, it's interesting to me, the same people that say that God ought not kill these children 
are the same people that don't want any laws against abortion. Why is it that when God plays God, it's immoral, but when we play God, we call that a moral right? God has the authority to give life and take life, but he doesn't do it arbitrarily. So that's the way I view those passages. And in fact, if you really want to get into this, there's a book written by Paul Copan called, called Is God a Moral Monster? And he gets into all these issues from the Old Testament and deals with them very well. So if you're really interested in this topic, I'd highly recommend you get that book, Is God a Moral Monster? This gentleman had a question too, Zach, right in front. And then we'll go back to that lady back there. Yes, sir. Um, one of my questions uh, relates to how God treated certain people in the Old Testament versus mm -hmm. how Christians treat them now. The easiest one to look at is sexual immorality, like homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Has has something about the death of Christ changed the way God looks at homosexuals because that was part of an old law? And are they able to live freely as homosexuals now if they believe in Christ and have full expectation of going to heaven? The laws, the mo see, there's, there's the moral laws and the civil laws, and they're, they're different. You know, many people are saying, well, you know, we couldn't eat shrimp in the Old Testament, so uh, homosexuality should go away too, or the, the prohibitions against homosexuality, just like the prohibitions against shrimp, but that's a misunderstanding of the Old Testament law. The prohibition against eating shrimp, if you ate it, you know, you were just unclean for a while, if you engaged in homosexuality, you were killed. So the penalty was different. One is moral, the other civil. But the whole Old Testament has passed away anyway. It's been fulfilled in Christ. The prohibitions against homosexual behavior have been reaffirmed. The penalty's different, just like all the penalties have been, are different. There's a difference between the offense and the penalty. In the Old Testament, they're in a theocracy. God is their king. In the New Testament, God is not the king of Israel in that sense anymore. And so the penalties are not the same. Now, with regard to sexual immorality today in the church, it's not just homosexuality that's a problem. The Bible prohibits any sexual behavior outside of the marriage of a man and a woman. That includes homosexuality. It also includes fornication, which is premarital sex. Oh, you can't say that in America. I just did. Um, it includes adultery. It includes pedophilia, includes incest, it includes bestiality, it includes any sexual behavior outside of that. But there, you see, there's a difference between attractions and actions. We all have attractions we ought not act on. And to say that because I have an attraction, that necessarily means I have to engage in the action would be silly. That would be like me saying, it's okay for me to gay bash because I was born with the anti-gay gene. Right? That doesn't make any sense. So... I think the Bible treats sex in a restrictive way for one extremely important, well, there's a number of reasons, but just from a pr pragmatic view, sex is like fire. If you keep it in your fireplace, it will warm you. Anywhere else in the house, it's going to burn your house down. And that's why it's restricted to the relationship between a man and a woman inside of marriage because sex outside of that bonds will ultimately destroy and that's true of any sexual contact. And in fact, if you think about this, most of the people we love, we don't have sex with. And if we did, it would destroy the relationship. Love, by definition, binds itself. There's no such thing as free sex or free love. That's not love. Love binds itself to the good of the loved one. So one of the reasons we're in such trouble in our country is because we've, the new religion is sex. And you know whose fault that is? It's our fault. Because the church has been quiet. Because the church has been doing some of the th same things the world's been doing. So we have this covenant of tolerance. I won't say anything negative about your bad behavior if you don't say anything negative about mine and we're all going down together, aren't we? Yes, ma'am. Okay, in the beginning you said that, well, with the comparisons of old and, and new Christianity, mm -hmm. 
You said that they were monotheists prior. I was just wondering why Moses wrote in the Old Testament, let us make man in our image, if they did not believe in No, I think they God. did. I just don't think it was as explicit in the Old Testament as the New. That's why I said the Trinity is hinted at in the Old Testament, but it's not as clear as it is in the New. So it's the same thing. Yeah, he was same a triune God, God in, the back, in the beginning, and they believed he was a triune God. They it, had to have because they called him Elohim, which is plural. Right. Well, they, they might have known, not known he was triune. They may have known he was plur, plural, but they didn't know who Jesus was yet. The Lord our God is one God. Yes. He's one. They knew that he was singular, and they knew that he was multiple. They knew he was singular in the sense that he had one divine nature, but there were multiple persons in that divine nature. But they didn't have the... Then they weren't monotheists the developed doctrine of the Trinity had not been developed until the progressive revelation of the New Testament. That's why Paul calls some things mysteries that are now revealed. So there were mysteries in the Old Testament that were revealed in the New Testament. They're worshiping exactly. the same God, but they didn't have as much information about that God as they do now. The New Testament is an explanation of the Old Testament. Yes. The Old Testament wasn't done away with because in Jeremiah, which is where God calls it in the New Testament, where the new covenant is given. It's in Jeremiah that he will give Israel the law on their hearts and in their minds and not on a stone because he wants it in our flesh so we can forgive and so we can have compassion on other people. But we still have to do what's right. Oh, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is the theocracy of the Old Testament is done away with. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 talks about tablets of stone being passed away. We're not under the, all the 611 laws or 613 laws of the Old Testament anymore. You agree with that, correct? I think that they still exist. We don't have a temple to do them in for one thing. We don't have a government like they had in Israel. They don't apply to us because we don't have the same governmental dictates that they had back then. You can't have they when they went to Babylon they didn't have their laws they didn't follow the laws of Israel when they were in Babylon they the couldn't because they were under a different government right well the, the question is should they have and should we do it today and I think the, the the testimony of the New Testament is all that has been fulfilled in Christ so we're free from the law that's Paul's whole point in Galatians so if he's fulfilled everything he's fulfilled thou shalt not kill and so we are free to do no those whatever. have been as I mentioned earlier those commands have been repeated in the New Testament but they're repeated in the New Testament and the Old Testament commands have been fulfilled by Christ. So when we put our trust in him, since he's fulfilled them, his righteousness is given to us. And since we can't fulfill all those laws, he has do done it for us. Now he's forgiven our sins. Yes, he has. And he's given us his righteousness. Would you do me a favor? Hmm? When you get home, would you go through Acts and find out all the places where Paul celebrated on the Sabbath and where Paul went into the synagogue after 20-some years of preaching? And, and go to Acts 21 and find out why he went in the temple with all those people to do the Nazarite vows and what those Nazarite, Nazarite vows would have included. Why did he do that? He went into the temple to try and get people to become Christians. And he said, I became all things to all men so that I may no, win some. No, you better go back and read that. You better okay. go back and read Acts well, remember, 21 and go through all of Acts okay. and figure out how many times he was there on the Sabbath. Okay, but let me mention one other thing. Acts, the, Acts mostly is a descriptive book. It's not a prescriptive book. But see, if he believed it was truly changed till Sunday, he would not have gone into the... the well, then he wouldn't have said in Colossians 2 that don't no. tell anybody you have to live a certain Sabbath day. No, he... That has nothing to do with the Sabbath. Okay, well, we'll okay. agree to disagree. Thank you. Okay, but the one you gave was, you should look it up. Okay. These are all internal conflicts among Christians. That's, that's fine. All right, you guys have been a great audience.